Hello and welcome back to Physical Geology lab videos here. Now today I want to cover the geologic time tutorial which covers pages 102 to 108 and then later in a second video I'm going to cover the geologic lab which is pages 110 to 116. Now for this first part you're labeling relative time events or sequence of events. We always put the oldest unit on the bottom and we put the youngest unit on the top. The old earth form would always be the, always be the oldest event and the youngest event would be around 400 common era was when the Roman Empire fell. So your job is to fill in these other points in, in between here. Now there are five events and we need to put those five events on this timeline. And note that this timeline is in billions of years. And so that means that every division here is really 500 million years. Note that they all also give us four arrows and our job is to put these five events into those four arrows. So that means that two of these events are close enough in time where they have to occupy the same arrow. So your job is to figure out which of those two events would occupy the same arrow. You'll go ahead and you'll look at these questions and there's some clues in here as to help, as to help you uh, determine which of these arrows would be the two events that are closer in time. Now, as you go along here, you'll see the, the, the general questions from students to, uh, here that are puzzled or wondering about some of these events. And you can answer these in pretty straightforward fashion. On the next page here, again, this will be pretty straightforward. We get to these unconformities. And these are really, uh, remember, they're sequences uh, or, or spans of geologic time that are not represented by physical rock units. In other words, the rocks may have been there and then were, were then eroded away or maybe it was a period in time where there was no deposition at this particular po point in Earth, and so there's no sediment that accumulated to record the geologic events, right? So again, periods of erosion, maybe periods of non-deposition, or in some cases we could even get tectonic upheaval where there's folding and faulting and buckling of the rocks, and then we see uh, we don't see uh, uh, deposition. Instead, we see the tectonic events, and then we see erosion as well going on in there. For these unconformities. Note that you'll kind of think about what would be a good place where sediment is being deposited or maybe a source of sediment being eroded. So you'll kind of go through those. And remember, I, I discuss all these in my, my video lectures online as well. Now, for question 15, uh, here we're looking at a particular type of unconformity where the older strata, C, B, and A, have been folded and buckled by some event, some tectonic upheaval that did not affect the younger units here, D. So this line here is one of those erosion events, which is probably one of those tectonic upheaval events because whatever event folded and buckled these did not affect letter D. So uh, uh, this type of unconformity would be an angular unconformity. So angular unconformity, you would place that right there. And then you can kind of talk, talk about two different things. Like, you know, for example, what two things might have happened? Well, sediment A, B, and C, they were deposited, they were lithified, and the other thing that could happen, they were, they were, then they were folded, or they were deposited, folded, and then an erosion event occurred, and then we have deposition of D. So there's several things that are happening before D uh, is deposited there, right? So you can write those in here. So just, you can just kind of spell out two different ones there. Question 16 kind of follows the same idea as question 12 up there, where uh, what, you what environment you think would be an unconformity, where there's no deposition or maybe erosion. And so obviously uh, river mouths and ocean floor are always accumulating sediment, whereas a mountain would be a source of sediment. So that'd be where erosion is occurring. Probably the mountain would be the best choice here, and then you would give some reason uh, as to why you, these other two would not be uh, places of unconformities. Again, like I said, uh, question 16 is similar to question 12. Now you can kind of uh, answer this question as well. Continuing on with unconformities here for questions 18 through 20 or 21 here, we're seeing, in this case, we have a crystalline basement. So remember, a crystalline basement is, is either a metamorphic rock or a plutonic igneous rock, like a granite, some sort of granitic rock, or in this case, a metamorphic rock. What granite, plutonic rocks, and metamorphic rocks, what they share in common is that they both, both formed at depth, right? So not on Earth's surface. Whereas shale, we know shale forms up here on Earth's, Earth's surface. That's a sedimentary rock. And so this, this contact between 
the shell and this metamorphic crystalline basement is an unconformity, a time gap, because you need time to erode whatever was above the metamorphic rock, expose it at the surface, and then put the new shale on top, right? So that's a time gap. So again, you would describe this one. And remember, this type of unconformity, uh, in my videos, I call it non-conformity, non-conformity. Kind of think about this question too. Give me some uh, notes here. We'll take a look at those. Now we'll move on to this absolute time or the numerical time where we use isotopes, atoms, atomic clocks, radioactivity to date geologic material. So for this one, we're looking at three different isotopic systems. Remember, these are the parent-daughter pairs. They're isotopic clocks, atomic clocks that keep a constant rate of time by decay. And we have carbon to the carbon 14, the nitrogen 14, uh, potassium argon system. And there's really two here in the uranium system. There's 235, 207, and 238, 206. So these are all independent atomic clocks that are keeping track of, of geologic time in a closed system. And so we can use these to date uh, rocks. And you can see mostly for uh, the potassium argon and the uranium systems, we can use them for volcanic rocks and also igneous plutonic rocks like granitic, granitic rocks. But note that for carbon, carbon can only be used for something that was once alive. So in my video lectures, I talk about how carbon-14 is being continuously made in the upper atmosphere, and then it, over time it decays in nitrogen-14. So as long as the organism is alive, it's getting its constant supply of carbon-14. As soon as the organism dies, the system closes, and the atomic clock begins to, to tick. And so note that here, we really can't go, go anything older than about 50,000 years, right? So we can't really date anything older than 50,000 years. And also that material had, had to have once been alive, like a plant or an animal, right? That was accumulating carbon through either photosynthesis or by eating organic molecules. Uh, it, was, it was getting its supply of carbon-14. But then when it dies, it's no longer receiving 14, so the, the system closes and we begin to have a parent-daughter atomic clock there. Look at these questions. Uh, remember, for dinosaur borns, dinosaurs lived or uh, went extinct around 65 million years ago. So obviously, we, we can't use carbon-14 because we can't. We, it only goes, out of, goes back to 50,000 years. We cannot use these because uh, uranium and potassium argon are only used for volcanic rocks or, or igneous plutonic rocks, right? So kind of think about these questions and then you can pick out what answer you, you want to choose there. For part two, here we're looking at a, a cross section with some sedimentary structures. Remember in, in sedimentary rocks, about, I talked about these cross beddings and cross beddings are like when sand dunes are being formed either on a coastal dune or ripples are being formed. And we always notice when they're being formed is that the, the tops of these dunes are being truncated. And so if we look closely at this section here, we see that these cross bedded forsets or dunes come to an end right there. So they're being cut by the next layer above it, which means that these have not been overturned. They're in their proper position. Uh, these units are going from older on the bottom to younger on top. So the sequence is in order. So that's that question here. Uh, based on the cross bedding, well, we can see that it, it's not overturned. All we can do in this section here, uh, we can't date the dinosaur bone directly, just as we proved in the previous question, but we can figure out the ages of units below and above it. So in other words, in this case here, in terms of relative time, relative to the others, we know the dinosaur bone has to be younger than unit A, but older than unit C, just because it sits in between, right? Now, for this next one, it's kind of the, the same idea, but here we have some lava flows, and we can date these radiometrically. In fact, they've done it right here. We don't know the exact age of the dinosaur bone, but we can bracket it between being younger than the age of volcanic rock A, but older than the age of volcanic rock C. So we can get a range for this, and uh, we won't get it exactly, but we can get a range. So you can kind of answer these questions there, and then again, you can answer the, the student questions down below. This next one, we're, we're gonna start playing with is these relative uh, geologic time puzzles, and one of the principles that we use is the principle of superposition, and obviously here, we're seeing limestone, shale, sandstone conglomerate. 
which Lamson would be the oldest based on the principle, principle of superposition, whereas conglomerate will be the youngest here. Also, what this is showing is that we know that limestone forms in deeper marine waters. Shale is kind of a outer continental shelf to shelf uh, environment, so it's shallower marine waters. And sandstone, we know, is, is either a continental shelf or a, a shoreline coastal environment. And then we know conglomerate forms in rivers. So this is showing over time where sea level was much deeper here and then sea level got shallow. So we call this a marine regression. Marine regression. And I talked about these a little bit in lecture. So, uh, and I do in my video lecture as well. So this would be a marine regression. Uh, remember, the other one would be a transgression. For question two here, again, we're, we're doing the same idea, kind of this geologic puzzle. We know that based on superposition, F would be the oldest unit. So we call that number one. Then number two would be a unit E, because that's the second one. And you can see that we got three, four. But remember, this, this, this erosion event right here, that's, that's an event we have to number. And that's an unconformity. And in this case, when you see parallel strata below and above the unconformity, you note know that they're parallel, it's not going to be angular unconformity. We don't have any crystalline basement here. So it is an erosion event, but between parallel sedimentary units, we call this a disconformity. So that's our third type of unconformity, disconformity. So it would be one, two, three, and then we have unit four would be C here, the, the disconformity is five, and then we have six and seven for B and A. So that would be the, uh, the relative sequence or order of events, where one is the oldest, seven is the youngest, right? Then you can answer these as we go along here. We haven't talked about geologic faults here, but remember a fault is a, a, a fracture um, in rocks where there's displacement or slippage. So obviously here there's some slippage. And when we talk about faults, um, here, here's a fault plane, and the, 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 the block above the fault plane is always called the hanging wall block, the hanging wall, because um, you can hang, if you, if you drill, made a mine shaft in here, and you can stand in here, you, you, would, you, would, you can hang something from the hanging wall, right? So that's why it's called hanging wall. So miners would use those terms. And then at uh, the same time, uh, this bottom area here is called the, the foot wall block, FW for foot wall. And that's because you could walk, in fact, you can see the miner down here, my little cartoon of a miner is walking down here on the foot wall, right? And so you can, you can literally walk on the foot wall here. So we, ha we have foot walls and hanging walls. And so the fault where the hanging wall moves down relative to the foot, to the foot wall, we call that a normal fault. So this is a normal fault. And so there's probably a question about that. Here we're gonna, we're gonna invoke two principles, the principle of superposition and the principle of cross-cutting relations. And so again, we wanna number the events here from, from oldest to youngest. And obviously the oldest would be Q and the youngest is probably gonna be this fault because the fault seems to cut everything. And we know that R intrusion R here has cut through N. So R based on the principle of cross cutting relations has to be younger than N. So try to figure out the relative orders of these events here. So obviously that's a fault for letter A and this pluton uh, is letter R and which is older unit R or the fault that cuts it. So based on the principle of cross cutting relations, the fault cuts the pluton R, so that means the fault has to be younger. And then now number the six events here in, in sequence, from oldest being one and youngest being six.